I'm John McKee, and I'm the editor of Messianic Apologetics. www.messianicapologetics.net. And I would like to welcome you to this episode of Messianic Insider, which has been entitled, What Are People Saying About the End Times? It has been around three weeks or so since we have had an episode of Messianic Insider, but those of you who follow me on social media are doubtlessly aware that I have not disappeared from the scene. This is a very uh, busy time of year for my family. Uh, we have actually been sick with some very nasty uh, head colds. I went almost a week without posting a McKee moment short. Uh, that's how bad things were. And then, uh, of course, last week we had Thanksgiving, and I hope you were able to see some of my uh, cooking videos uh, from our family's annual pre-Thanksgiving barbecue. So there's been a lot happening behind the scenes, uh, but haven't disappeared in terms of writing projects, research projects. I have just finished the uh, second read, so that would be on the computer, of the Torah in the Balance Volumes 1 and 2 combination book. So uh, Volume 1 was originally released in 2003, uh, Volume 2 in 2015. Unfortunately, many people buy Volume 1 and they don't realize that there's a Volume 2 as well. Uh, so as part of the ongoing rotation of updating some of our older publications, uh, Tour in the Balance will be volume one and two put together. Uh, yesterday, I finished writing the appendix chapter, and I'm starting to print the uh, book out now uh, in various stages and will uh, do my final edit on paper. So I'm shooting for a release of the first quarter in 2024. Another uh, project I've got going on is a commentary, the Sermon on the Mount for the Practical Messianic. I've already written the introduction to that. I've completed the notes for Matthew chapter 5, and uh, very soon hope to start writing the commentary for Matthew chapter 5. This is something which is taking a little longer than I expected, but I think it has to do with the fact that so much of the Sermon on the Mount is connected to ethical and moral issues, which many of today's Messianic people, whether they want to admit it or not, are not that strong about. When we turn to the Sermon on the Mount, we just want to see from Matthew 5, 17 through 19 that God's Torah remains valid and relevant instruction, and then we don't spend a huge amount of time focusing more specifically on what Yeshua's fulfillment of the law and the prophets mainly composes. So this is going to be, I think, a very important study as we forecast ahead uh, with some of the things I do believe the Lord wants us to achieve as a Messianic faith community. For many of us, over the past several weeks, uh, several months now, going back to October the 7th, uh, 2023, much of our attention almost every day now is focused on the Israel-Hamas conflict. And there are uh, many elements to this uh, regarding security in the Middle East, regarding how people have responded to this, both politically as well as socially, and also how people have responded to this theologically. 
uh, we've been able to see as a result of the Israel-Hamas conflict, many people in the world of theology, not just progressives, but even a few conservatives, expose themselves as being supporters of supersessionism or replacement theology. They really do believe that the promises given by God to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have concluded. Other people who believe that God is not finished with Israel or the Jewish people are very concerned about what the conflict between Israel and Hamas symbolizes, whether that is simply all of the acts of anti-Semitism, which are taking place all around the world, all of the pro-Palestinian marches, which are not just advocating for a Palestinian state, but frequently are advocating for dreadful harm, if not annihilation, to be committed against the Jews, but also what it signals regarding when we are on the proverbial timeline. When are we in terms of the last days and how close we are or not to the return of the Messiah? And in today's Messianic community, people are definitely talking and we need to pay attention. I know I've said this many times, but over the past several years, four years ago, as 2019 was ending and we were getting ready to enter into calendar year 2020, I went to, and I mean this with a lot of love and respect, but I went to the IMCS Rabbis Conference and the theme was having 2020 vision. And of course I wear glasses. So it's something that uh, I paid attention to. 2020 vision for the 2020s. And of course, what immediately happened within the first three months of 2020 with different lockdowns and then other things by the end of 2020 and things which have taken place since then, it's like, wait a second, I don't want to have 2020 vision. I want to have blurred vision. I don't want to see all of these things. And many people, of course, have been paying very close attention to what has changed over the past three to four years. Not everyone in the Messianic community has been paying attention to when we possibly are. But when things take place in Israel, when things take place in the Middle East, when we see violent acts of anti-Semitism, perhaps at a level which have not been witnessed since the Second World War, people begin to pay attention, they begin to entreat the Lord for answers, and they begin to assert more of a wartime footing. A few weeks ago, I was locally uh, in attendance at a Wednesday night Bible study home group, which I've actually been a part of uh, for over seven years now. And we hadn't been able to meet for a few weeks, uh, illnesses, uh, family business, that sort of thing. Uh, but understandably, uh, everyone who uh, showed up, in particular who showed up early, you know, were just sitting down and we were uh, you know, talking about all of the things that we had been witnessing since the uh, Israel-Hamas conflict began. And, you know, there is a deep stirring on the part of people in today's Messianic community uh, regarding when are we? Are we getting closer to the Lord's return? What is different now? How do we need to be approaching issues in America and issues in the world differently than we have in the past. How soon are we? How tense are things going to get? And all of these discussions were taking place, and I'm not going to go into all of the details, but no one who was in attendance 
was pre-trib. No one was expecting that, well, right around the corner, things are going to get really bad, and then the Lord is going to come and remove believers from planet Earth, and then the tribulation period will begin. No, instead, it was, you know, we need to be very conscientious of the people in our communities, in our metropolitan environments. We need to be very careful, in particular, when it comes to the Islamic community and what they are permitted to do in terms of protesting and what they are seemingly getting away with sometimes with, uh, you know, under the guise of free speech, quote unquote. We need to be very conscientious of how people in the religious community, the established church, are responding to the Israel-Hamas conflict. I was reminded by a friend of mine who said, you know, John, I think it was back in 2015, you said something uh, to the effect that when homosexual marriage was legalized in the United States of America, things shifted in the spirit. Things were no longer the same as they had been. Things were very different. And I said, yes, I remember that. I, I, I remember back in 2015, waking up and just feeling that something was off. Something was much different spiritually and culturally. And of course, we've seen just with that issue, uh, how that's gotten out of control and out of hand with LGBTQ plus and woke deconstruction, affirming, et cetera. And then I reminded everyone there, uh, you need to kind of remember how when the when homosexual marriage was legalized here in the United States, that you know different denominations, uh, of course, have been voting on whether or not to permit same-sex marriage, ordination of gay and lesbian clergy. Many of the denominations which have had those debates have either immediately before or immediately after voted on divestment from Israel. So the uh, different retirement funds usually of uh, the, the clergy, the pastors, should not be in companies which do significant business with Israel, uh, mainly uh, different defense contractors. And is there a relationship between denominations which are voting to change their disciplines and change their position on uh, homosexuality and now transgender and divesting from Israel and embracing the BDS boycott divestment sanctions movement? Well, there's no question that these are different road signs. We are getting closer to the Messiah's return, and we need to be paying attention, and, and we have to be acting accordingly. Now, I did politely also interject because, you know, people are concerned, they're emotional, uh, they are even a little afraid. I said, you know, all of us need to be paying attention. All of us need to be uh, at a constant yellow alert, you know, shields up. But we also need to be cognizant that what we say, particularly in terms of forecasting events, will be held against us if things don't necessarily materialize as we think they might. And I brought up how 26, 27 years ago, uh, when our family was first getting involved in the Messianic community, how a major uh, magnet, which was pulling many non-Jewish people into the movement at the time, was anticipating significant and time-related events to take place with Y2K and the turn of the millennium, and that how there were people who believed that in September of 1993, so that's over 30 years ago itself, the Middle East Peace Accord signed on the White House lawn between Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat, that that initiated the seven-year tribulation 
period. And they were anticipating that in March of 1997, the abomination of desolation would take place and that the Messiah would return on and around the year 2000. Now, of course, we're now in calendar year 2023, almost 2024. So I just politely interjected. We don't need to be caught speaking presumptuously. Uh, we know we're getting closer. We know that we need to be very cognizant and very aware of our surroundings, and we need to be concerned about what's taking place. But we have to think smartly, and we don't need to be caught crying wolf. We just need to be aware that we're getting closer and that the walls are closing in. Now, I know that many of you who watch or listen to our ministry teachings, you are, statistically speaking, more likely than not, non-Jewish. Although we have many Messianic Jewish believers who pay attention, but we've got more non-Jews who follow us than, than Messianic Jews. And that's that's okay. We believe in reaching out to everyone. But when you fellowship regularly with Messianic Jewish believers, and there are things taking place like Israel and Hamas, all of these pro-Palestinian uh, protests, which get violent. You see acts of anti-Semitism uh, in your local community. You see all of this pressure issued internationally against Israel, and you severely wonder what is going on. As a non-Jewish person, you are detached from these things in a way a Jewish person is not. Now, you may think, oh, this is terrible. You know, I'm going to stand with my Messianic Jewish brothers and sisters. I'm going to stand with members of the Jewish community. Uh, we believe that God's promises to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are yes and amen. And just like Ruth said, your people will be my people, your God, my God, and even where you were buried, I will be buried. You can go that far. And indeed, there are scores of examples of non-Jewish people who've stood against acts of anti-Semitism. And as we know from the Second World War, many were taken to the camps along with their Jewish neighbors. But if you are a Jewish person, a Messianic Jewish believer in a Western country, even the United States of America, and you see these things happening, your not only sensitivity meter, but your phobia meter you know, goes off the charts. And if you are not Jewish, you, I think, are incapable, and I include myself in this, of fully understanding some of the deep concerns, fears, anxieties that many of today's Messianic Jews, when they see what's happening in the land of Israel, when they see the conflict between Israel and Hamas, when they see levels of violence, which haven't really been seen since the Second World War, they are beyond fearful, uh, at least at certain times. And we have to keep that in mind. And you, know, you can pray all you want. You can stand with them all you want. You can try to understand these conflicts and protest against the anti-Semitism all you want. But unless you are a direct participant in the Jewish experience, and I include myself in this, because I'm not a direct participant in the Jewish experience, you cannot fully comprehend the amount of fear and anxiety which are going through the hearts and minds of many people in the Jewish community right now, including much of the Messianic Jewish community. And so there is this real burden. There's this real urge to want to figure out what is going on. I'd even say, you know, what the hell is happening? Because all hell seems to be breaking loose right now. And so 
having been in the study and you know going back and forth and trying to uh, you know tactfully you know consider a number of things, what this led to was a Bible study on the Olivet Discourse, Matthew twenty four verses one through fourteen. That is as far as we got, and actually. Uh, I was the one who was asked to read uh, this passage. So uh, kind of going through this uh, again, uh, I would like to read the verses that we read. Uh, Matthew 24, verses 1 through 14, and I'm reading this from New American Standard. And Yeshua came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple's excuse me, the temple buildings to him. And he answered and said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Yeshua answered and said to them, see to it, that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah and will mislead many. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places, there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and will deliver up one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved." And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. Matthew 24, uh, 1 through 14, New American Standard. Now, I know that many of you have heard uh, my family uh, teach on the Olivet Discourse before. Uh, you've probably been involved in studies, discussion groups going through uh, end-time prophecy. I've got an open folder, an open file on hopefully a future a study of prophecy and many different passages. But in our home group, Wednesday night study group, a few weeks ago, we read this to, of course, focus on the words of the Messiah, to focus on how Everything which we have been talking about, everything which we've been observing, it was to be anticipated. And interestingly enough, uh, I think the discussion shifted all of a sudden because uh, the group leader is a clinical psychologist, and he wanted to talk about all of the sinful activities which he has witnessed in his profession, all of the people who justify doing this or doing that you know, different strokes for different folks, uh, whatever makes you feel good, uh, whether it's, you know, indulgence of the flesh, drugs, sex, alcohol, whatever it may be. Uh, and so the discussion, you know, shifted more to on the ground things, which all of us are witnessing in our communities, uh, in our school system, in our society, and how sinful activities have just gotten out of control. So we really didn't focus that much on, okay, wars and rumors of wars, and then things leading up to, as we know from uh, Matthew 24, 15, following the abomination of desolation. Although I did mention, oh, I, rem I remember how I did mention that uh, you know, many people, ourselves included, are anticipating as some of the decisive signs to witness that, okay, things have really just began, started accelerating. We do expect to see animal sacrifices resume on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And 
everyone holding to a standard premillennial eschatology would say yes. And then I also interjected, uh, do I expect the third temple to be rebuilt? Yes, but a, a, a minimal uh, interpretation would at least require there to be a tabernacle or temple, excuse me, a tabernacle or tent uh, similar to uh, what took place during the reign of King David. And everyone agreed to that. So in spite of uh, different claims which might be made, uh, the abomination of desolation, at the very least, would require a tent tabernacle structure. Uh, but we are anticipating a temple. And how do we know that it's only going to be operational for a short time? But we'll just have to wait and find out. So the discussion led more to, you know, because this is a prayer group, led more to, you know, the proliferation of great sin, the issues of love growing cold, and a lot of the rejections we experience as believers, uh, how everything that we are witnessing is the consequence of rejecting God and rejecting God's law. And how the real conflict uh, each of us has to face is within our own hearts and making sure that we are in alignment with, more than anything else, those high ethical and moral principles of God's law. And it was a very uh, edifying time, and I think a lot of people found some solace and some comfort. And, and certainly, as I have uh, look back on the past several weeks, I know that uh, we're going to have to have more of these kinds of discussions because things are seemingly getting out of control. And and how many people, in particular, because of a lot of the false predictions and false prognostications of the 1990s and 2000 aughts and into the 2010s, don't really want to talk about this. Yet, uh, you know, and I'm not going to predict you know, date X, Y, Z by any means. But as we know, people are crying out for answers and that we see these conflicts, Israel, Hamas, uh, not going to get into it, but we know that there are uh, huge economic questions uh, to, to be raised. We know that things are changing and that uh it's not business as usual anymore. What should we be focusing on as not only born-again believers, those who've been filled with the Holy Spirit, but those who compose a messianic movement, which we have invoked upon ourselves the moniker, the end time move of God. We believe that our faith community, because it is focused on Israel, the salvation of the Jewish people, the restoration of the kingdom to Israel, and yes, also seeing non-Jewish believers who've been genuinely called, often by first partaking of their faith heritage in Israel's scriptures, serving alongside Jewish believers in the salvation of Israel as co-laborers. What we do, we believe, is to herald the return of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So what should we be focusing on? You know, what should you be focusing on in your personal Bible studies, in your theological studies? As obvious as it is, we need to do our best to have a better handle on what God wants us to achieve. Have you even asked yourself the question, what does God want us to achieve? What does God want me to do with myself? Is God going to give me the resources, the tools, the talents, the abilities, the skills to contribute to that Romans 11, 25, 26 following trajectory? All Israel will be saved. If you are a non-Jewish believer in Israel's Messiah, now is an excellent time to be equipped and used by the Lord to be a vessel of great mercy, great love, great support. 
being a significant ally of Jewish people who do not know the living Yeshua as their savior. We need a better handle on what God wants us to achieve. We need to be able to maximize our effectiveness in reaching the lost. Let's face it, there are hundreds of millions, if not billions of people on planet Earth who are going to hell, and they are going to spend an eternity separated from their creator. And they have many questions about who God is, who they are as human beings, how we got here as human beings. Is the Bible something which is reliable, or is it a book of fairy tales? I mean, just this past uh, morning, I was on Instagram, of course, posting some of our ministry updates, and I saw uh, a few short videos from some historical atheist agnostics. It was Isaac Asimov and Carl Sagan, uh, both of whom had Jewish background, by the way. And I thought to myself, these gentlemen, very well-spoken, they communicate in a very logical, rational way. Are we as messianic people, or as we are we as people willing to engage with some of their arguments and some of the points which they raise? And I know, at least for me, many of the people I interact with couldn't care less because they are that fundamentalist and that simplistic, and they're that much in a bubble regarding their worldview. So maximizing our effectiveness in reaching the lost means having a better concern for the questions raised by those who are lost, a sincere engagement with the points which they raise, and if necessary, also being able to say, you know, uh, some people I knew, some people I grew up with, they approached this inappropriately and they unnecessarily turned people away from the God of creation and the salvation provided in his son. And then a third thing I do think we need to be focusing on is if you are approaching the end times, if you're approaching the return of Yeshua, if there is no higher calling, no higher vocation than impacting the world with the salvation you have and the good news of redemption available in the Messiah of Israel, then those who are born-again believers need to be about better living the sacrificed life. We all read uh, from Romans chapter 12 that we are to be as though we are living sacrifices. And we, as Messianics, believe there's significant background in the Torah, Leviticus, Numbers. If there were animal sacrifices to be offered to the God of Israel, and they had to be a very high quality, then if we are to be living sacrifices, we are to be of high quality. We are to be blameless. We are to be holy as we emulate the Lord Yeshua, who uh, asked his followers and asks us to pick up our execution stake or cross daily. But what does that mean? What does it mean to pick up your execution stake or cross daily? A huge part of what it means is those who are spiritually regenerated, those who follow Yeshua as their Lord, are to be delivered from various entitlements, various things that, well, everyone else gets to participate in this or that, or, you know, wait a second, you know, all of my friends, you know, they got away with this, they got away with that, you know, they, they're going on with their lives, their careers, they've got all this money, they've got this, they've got that. Why can't I have any of that? We have to each be delivered from that. We have to recognize that if we are servants of the king and we serve the kingdom of heaven, that 
the kingdom of heaven has a value system, which is very different than the value system of the world. Yeshua himself told Pontius Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. And that's something which is very difficult for many people. Many people believe that they're entitled to a certain level of income. They're entitled to a spouse and children. They're entitled to vacations. They're entitled to, and we can go on and on and on. So if you're approaching the end times and you recognize that the mission is to see as many people as can be rescued, you have to make sure that any entitlements that you think that are due you are removed. And you need to recognize instead that God gives God's servants the resources and the things they need to accomplish the work he has assigned to them. And then finally, if we are approaching the return of Yeshua, and again, I'm not putting this on some kind of calendar or some kind of date. I'm not doing that. I'm instead wanting us to shift our thoughts and our motives toward the mission, toward serving the interests of the kingdom heralding the return of the king. The end times are not about any of us having the answers to all of the mysteries of the last days. Yes, we need to be studying end time prophecy. We need to be studying eschatology. We need to have different opinions circulating out there. Hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? But it's not about being a man or woman of insight or wisdom, someone who can figure out the identity of the anti-Messiah or antichrist. Because guess what? If you are not serving the true Messiah of Israel, and I'm going to pose this as a question, are you anti-Messiah? Are you antichrist? Yes, I believe there's going to be a singular figure, a false messiah figure. But what good is it going to do me if I figure out who that is? Because just about anyone who doesn't truly believe and truly know the genuine messiah of Israel is 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 a fault is is anti-messiah, is antichrist. The end times is not about trying to have answers to all of the mysteries. We do need to study the word. We need to study prophecy. It is instead about endurance. It's instead about perseverance. It's about seeing oneself through to the end. It's about maintaining one's faith and one's allegiance to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to the end. So, when he returns, we can truly be welcomed into his kingdom. And with that in mind, I'd like to read a passage which uh, some of you probably haven't heard uh, that often or perhaps even that frequently. But what does it mean to endure? What does it mean to persevere? And I was directed to, as I was putting my notes together, 2 Corinthians 11, 18 through 33, where the Apostle Paul, in defending his apostleship to the Corinthians, has to remind them of some of the things he has endured for his gospel service. And he's actually comparing and contrasting himself, uh, in all probability, to uh, different uh, Jewish believers who were disparaging uh, Paul as a legitimate apostle. So 2 Corinthians 11, verses 18 through 33, he says, this is from New American Standard. Since many boast according to the flesh, I will boast also. For you, being so wise, bear with the foolish gladly, for you bear 
with anyone if he enslaves you, if he devours you, if he takes advantage of you, if he exalts himself, if he hits you in the face. To my shame, I must say that we have been weak by comparison, but in whatever respect anyone else is bold, I speak in foolishness. I am just as bold myself. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Messiah? I speak as if insane. I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure upon me of concern for all the assemblies. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Yeshua, he who is blessed forever, knows I am not lying. In Damascus, the ethnarch under Aretas the king was guarding the city of the Damascenes in order to seize me. And I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and so escaped his hands. 2 Corinthians 11, 18 through 33. Now for certain, uh, in Paul's letter of 2 Corinthians, in him defending his apostleship, the genuineness of his apostleship, rhetorically, Paul's intention was to say, look, all of these people you are being influenced by can boast about this or boast about that. Let me tell you some of the things I really have had to go through. And I know that today there are many people who they invoke the end times, uh, they use it to stir the pot, to gain a following, they use it to solicit donations sell books, whatever the case may be. But when you really think about the end times, and when you really recognize that God's people are going to go through difficulty, how would you handle some of the things Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 11, 18 through 33? How quickly would you fold, as it were, how quickly would you give up when encountering difficulty or stress? Have any of you had a social media account blocked for 30 days? Have any of you had something suspended out there? How quickly would it take you to say, okay, I'm just going to, and then you end up at least not denying your faith, but you end up uh, playing a proverbial shell game with your faith. People who, well, I didn't deny Yeshua. I denied Jesus. We have to take more seriously things like 2 Corinthians 11, 18 through 33. We have to take more seriously the difficulties experienced by the prophets of ancient Israel, and truly the challenging path of discipleship laid forth by the Messiah of Israel. Are we up to it? I think many of us actually are. I know that many of us, when we see what's happening in the world, we're ready for this thing to be over with. Lord, it's time for you to return and to reign from your throne in Jerusalem. Too many people out there are saying that you're not returning to Jerusalem. That's just some, you know, abstract symbol. And 
Are they genuine brothers and sisters or not? Many of us are, we're ready to get this thing over with, but are we really ready to contemplate what it means to persevere, endure to the end? And as I've said with many topics, I do not believe this is going to be the last time we discuss the question, what are people saying about the end times? As always, on behalf of Outreach Israel Ministries and Messianic Apologetics, I would like to sincerely thank you for your ongoing prayers and support of our ministry efforts. We will see you again soon with another episode of Messianic Insider. Until then, may God bless you, shalom, and take care.